boron is abundant and can be mined uh, in my kitchen. You know, there's probably a few kilograms. Is, is boron, boron 11 the main isotope or there's... 80% of natural boron is okay. boron 11. Okay. Yeah. So well, it's not all of it. It's, it's, it's certainly most of it. So it's abundant. Um, the products of the reaction are not radioactive. So in essence, while it's nuclear power, it doesn't have any of the downsides of uh, either regular nuclear uh, power where the byproducts take decades, millennia to, to decompose. The sourcing of the fuels is also not a problem. This is the reason why everybody has been failing at fusion. They've been doing it wrong. They're not even going down the right path. They've been too busy working on tokamaks and stellarators. They should have been more concerned about what fuel are you using and what kind of reaction are you trying to produce? The secret, the holy grail is directed energy conversion into electricity. And what he's saying here is that boron 11 reaction is non-thermal. It's producing electricity directly. What's critical about this though, is that all other fusion approaches have all focused on thermal fusion. So specifically yeah. that carries the enormous technical challenges of heating fuels to hundreds of millions of degrees. Now, the reason why the hydrogen boron reaction hasn't been considered is the temperatures that you need to achieve for a thermal fusion are billions of degrees, which is, is just not realistic. Really. Yes. The significance of what we're doing really is, is picking up from the work of one of our co-founders, Professor uh, Heinrich Horror, also uh, from UNSW, who proposed that a non-thermal approach to fusion might work, and that might open the possibility of this hydrogen boron reaction. Okay. As history has, uh, as science has developed, lasers have come of age. Largely, the the, the discoveries that we're that we're interested in, the significance of them was marked by the the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics shared between uh, Gerard Maru and Von Strickland mm -hmm. for the development of chirp pulse amplification lasers, which can provide. I know what that means. Chirped pulse amplification, the 2018 Nobel Prize. The thing that they use to make atto second lasers that won the Nobel Prize in 2023. It's it's not tabletop physics. Still, you can't do that in your kitchen. You'll need some substantial equipment, access to facilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So the you know the key that we need is is a very high powered laser, specifically a petawatt laser. Petawatt. How many zeros is that? Oh. I'll put it on screen on the, when I did the video. Okay, thanks, Francois. <laughs> uh, but typically, we would be putting hundreds 15. to a thousand joules within a nanosecond or femtosecond pulse, depending on what mm. laser that we that we need. So one, so instead of a laser that has a stream of light, where we've got a sledgehammer where we're pulsing one very very big pulse of light. Okay, that's a key factor. Okay. Non-equilibrium. So we're talking about you can call them cold plasmas. Plasmas that do not obey the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of the electrons within them. Okay. And that okay. gives you an idea. How could these plasmas uh, be created? Hint, hint, atto, second, femto, second lasers, among other things. The other easier way to create these. Atto, second lasers can produce the cold non-equilibrium plasmas. Hint, hint. Uh, people should probably go take a look at Salvatore Pais's patents right about now. High energy electromagnetic field generator. Magnetically confined fusion patent. Pretty familiar. That this approach will y yield an exothermic reaction. That's, that's the essence of it. Right? Yeah, I, technically, I don't think it's an exothermic reaction. I technically, think. it is because it obviously creates energy. Yeah. But it's not a thermal reaction. The ah. purpose of the reaction is we're not generating heat. We are generating energetic charged particles by which the energy, either through the charge of the particles or the energy as they explode from the nuclear yeah. reaction is directly captured. I so see. we're not That's creating That's an important heat. difference. Yes, I see. Directed energy conversion. He said it right there. We're doing it not through heat. We're doing it through a directed energy conversion mechanism. It's not exothermic. The information definitely leaks out to the public about these technologies and the things that they're doing. Nobody puts the pieces together. The piece that everybody needs to know is something called dense plasma focus.
That was the paper that was connected between Frank Mead, Dave Froning, and George Miley. Dense plasma focus. George Miley says that if you condense your plasma enough, it becomes super conductive. Super conductive. Why? Because you're making a plasma, which is just matter, and you're packing it in, squeezing it in. Now, let's go back to Eric Lerner. So Eric Lerner, this is... a I'm not going to call it cold fusion anymore. I'm going to actually start calling it cool fusion as well. Cool fusion. Because it turns out it's actually high temperatures, but it doesn't produce high temperatures. It requires high temperatures, but doesn't produce high temperatures. So it's actually the biggest PSYOP of all. All these PSYOPs are crazy because they're literally designed to get you to ignore something. That they'll make you think something's impossible when it's not. A neutronic fusion clearly, is the other way. You have charged nuclei coming in and charged nuclei going out of the reaction. The biggest example of this is hydrogen boron. You take ordinary hydrogen, the dominant isotope of boron, they come together at high temperature and you produce three helium nuclei, all charged particles coming out. Big advantage, no radioactive waste. Second big advantage, since the energy is now carried by charged particles and moving charged particles are electricity, that's what electric current is, you can potentially get the energy out directly without going through a heat cycle. So potentially, a neutronic fusion is the only type of energy source we know of that can potentially be not only much cleaner than energy, any energy source. We I get it. I know why they used a, a jet. Because a jet is a turbine. A turbine is just a generator. A turbine is just a generator. And they realize, oh, we don't need moving parts anymore. We don't need moving parts anymore. Once we don't need moving parts anymore, they figure out a neutronic fusion. They figure out directed energy conversion. Literally just pull the electrons off of the ions. You separate them and you've created electricity. Let's go directly to the source. What is electricity? It's a dipole. A separation of positive and minus charge. Electricity isn't sitting there pumping a, turning a, you know, whatever, a butter churning thing. That's not electricity. If we want to get fusion as a useful source of energy, the first step we have to arrive at is getting more energy out of a device than we put into it. That's pretty obvious. Otherwise, we're burning energy. We're not producing it. There are basically four ingredients to getting to net energy. Which, of course, so far, none of us have gotten. I'm listening. First, you have to raise the material to very high temperature. That's so that the nuclei have enough velocity, which is temperature, to overcome their electric repulsion, because they're both positively charged, and get close enough for the nuclear reaction, which is very short range, to grab them and pull them together. Okay, so we need temperature, confinement time, and we need density. Well, density we can cover, right? We're going to make a dense plasma. Temperature, I'm not convinced that we need temperature as high as that they're saying, but maybe we do. Confinement time, we can cover with magnets. Superconducting magnets can control the confinement time. So at least two of these we got covered. The third one is up for debate. I want to skip ahead to a different one here. Different presentation. Oh, this is a man-sized or person-sized machine. The type of machine that this is, is called a dense plasma focus, TP. <clears throat> well, you had my curiosity, sir, and now you have my attention. You just said the magic words, dense plasma focus. I think we'll listen. Yeah, it's also called plasma focus just to confuse people. Our combination of this sort of machine with hydrogen boron fuel is what we term focus fusion. Focus fusion one is our experimental device, which has been operating since 2009 in Middlesex, New Jersey. The basic idea of this device is to exploit a phenomenon that occurs in nature, which is quite different than the approaches of the other devices. This phenomenon is called the pinch effect. It was actually discovered, although not named as pinch effect, 200 years ago by Ampere, the guy we named amps after. The bench effect occurred because when two currents are moving in the same direction, they create magnetic fields, and the interaction of those magnetic fields attract the currents together. 
So this is a basic organizing principle, not only of- 100%, this is what the orbs are doing in the MH370 video. So this is- 100%, this is what they're doing. This is how they figured it out. They're creating a funnel. The electrons come flooding in and what happens? They get pinched together. This also slows them down, just like a traffic jam. Slows them down, causes them to pinch together. Boom. This is what they're doing with boron, a neutron fusion. I would pretty much bet anything the orbs are using boron 11 fusion to fly around at this point. The basic organizing principle, not only of electricity, but of the universe. Because whenever you have plasma, you have currents. And if the currents are moving together, they attract each other. If they're moving opposite, they repel each other. Now, I'm going to try and explain how this operates in our device. Construction is one of the simplest devices, fusion devices. In its operation, it isn't one of the simplest. So it takes a little explanation. The core of our device is two concentric electrodes separated by an insulator. The outer one is called a cathode. It's the negative. The inner one is the anode, positive. There's an insulator in between. Energy from capacitors is dumped on these uh, electrodes, which are inside a vacuum chamber. Yeah, I got to highlight. How do I pause this? Oh, there we go. Okay. I got to highlight what Ocean just said here because if this is really it. They figured out plasma waves. Guys, do you know what the study of plasma waves is called? It's called plasma physics. Literally, that's what plasma physics is. Try and understand the movement of plasma as a liquid. Well, what did we just hear? We just heard if you can get the currents to line up in your plasma, you can squeeze them together and you can get fusion to happen. They're definitely, definitely using this process in the orbs. It's exactly what they're doing. This is why we see the lines in front of the orbs and behind them because their plasma is being compressed through the orb. As it comes through it, the magnets on it compress it and also create the bubble around it as well simultaneously. The first one, which is illustrated in this animation, is the filamentation instability. So you start out with a smooth plasma, and the plasma comes together with what are called filaments, which are dense wow. vortices. Look at this. Look at this. Together. Look at these awesome graphics. So that makes the plasma, that's the first step in making it hotter and denser. So pinching creates the filaments. You know, what's interesting is that I was just listening to Eric Dollard say that fusion doesn't happen in the center of the sun. Fusion only happens in the filaments is what he was saying. Fusion only happens in the filaments. And now here we're going, we're saying the pinch effect, this is how it works. It creates the filaments and then they're all going to come together here at the end. Now, the friction of the electrons moving through the filament start to heat the plasma up, just like the electrons in a light bulb filament heat it up. The electromagnetic forces on these currents force them to move yes. to the end of the anode. Yes. The anode is designed to be hollow. It has a hole in the middle. So the current actually fountains together inside the hole in the anode. And people, including us, have taken pictures to show exactly how this happens. Well, as that happens, a second Wait for it. develops because these filaments are all close to each other and moving in the same direction. Wait for it. They attract each other. And that produces what people call the pinch, even though this is sort of the second pinch effect. So they're all drawn together and they merge into a single filament. The next thing that happens is that filament starts to twist up. It becomes coiled. And these coils start to attract each other because they're moving in the same direction. So it becomes more and more coil, it's called a kinking instability. Eventually, just like a landline, if any of you still have landlines, it becomes twisted, it becomes twisted up in a little knot. And that knot, which is illustrated in this animation, we call the plasma bed. What? That knot we call the plasmoid. We're looking at a plasmoid in the center with two streams, one going behind it and one going in front of it. This is what is inside the orbs. This is what's inside the orbs. 
This is why you see a line in front of the orbs and behind the orbs. The reason why we don't see the plasmoid itself is because it's surrounded in a bubble of plasma. It's surrounded in a bubble of plasma. <laughs> Holy crap. When I saw that, I just went, that has to be what it is. It's not anything else. It's literally this. It's literally a Z-pinch boron plasma compact fusion reactor. That's what the orbs are. We're looking at, and you can't see the, the, the plasmoid in the middle, but there's a plasmoid in there. There's a plasmoid in there. They're using the Z-pinch effect. And the, the proof is the heat signature of the orb. The heat signature of the orb, you see here at the end when it, it slows down, you can see the, the one is all white there, but the other one's like partially black. The heat signature is the electrons. The heat signature is the electrons clustered together. They're clustered together because they're using this reverse field configuration or whatever the hell it's called. Literally causes them to cluster together. This is exactly what Ken Shoulders was saying about his plasmoid research. When Ken Shoulders was doing EVOs, plasmoids, he said the electrons were clustering together. Well, now we know why. Like people ask, well, why have they not turned this into a reactor? Well, technically they have, but why is it not a stable reactor? Because you got jets of energy shooting out of both sides, guys. You need it to be something flying around in the sky, at least with this design. They're using the kink instability as a bonus. Instead of looking at the kink instability and going, oh, we can't do this because how do we deal with these jets of ions and electrons or whatever the hell is shooting out protons and electrons? How do we deal with that? And people went, we'll just use it as a propulsion mechanism. They're like, it's not a bad thing. If you want it to fly around, the kink instability is great. IEC fusion, boron, hydrogen, plasmoid. That's what they're using. We call the plasmoid. Look at this thing. Inside that plasmoid, temperatures can reach extremely hot because the uh, plasma has been compressed so much that its frictional force is heated up. That's how they pulled it off. How did they get the temperatures? They have the plasma is dense enough. It's dense enough that it's, it's hot enough for them to cause it. The friction causes the temperature that's required. So this part, this is where I had to message my buddy Dave Rossi. And I went, okay, bro, is there actually even something like mechanically even inside these orbs? Because now we're getting to the point where, like Bob Greenier was saying, it's actually getting scientifically possible that the, the plasma is so dense that it's creating a magnetic field strong enough to contain itself. I still think there's something physically inside. I still think they're using superconducting ring magnets inside that. but. If it does, it might get to the point where they can just produce it like a lighter. Like you flip a lighter, but the light, like imagine the flame just rolling around, flying by itself. We know it's possible because we've seen smoke rings. The sun's core is only 1 keV. The sun's core is only 1 keV. This fusion process is 260 keV. So anyone who says, oh, it can't do it or whatever. Well, then you don't think the sun can produce fusion either, right? Or it says, oh, we can produce hydrogen fusion, but it can't do boron fusion. Nah, I'm pretty sure it can. In addition, another instability produces the acceleration of an ion beam out one direction, an electron beam out the other. What that means is that a lot of the energy in the fusion reaction actually ends up in a directed ion beam. If you have a directed ion beam and you take essentially a sophisticated form of coil, you can induce a current in the circuit. Free electron beam, anybody? Free electron laser, anyone? Seems like you could use that for some sort of propulsion mechanism. This is awesome. This is awesome. Dense plasma focus. That 
and plasma focus.